we've got same-sex marriage, and that's really great. So what next? What more can we possibly want? Plenty. There's lots more to still do. It's true that all the major anti-LGBT laws have now been repealed. For the most part, we do have equality. But there are still some unfinished tasks. There's still lots of many small, irritating inequalities that remain and need to be remedied. So take same-sex marriage. We have it, but it's not equal marriage. What we have today is segregation in marriage law. There are two different marriage laws in this country. There's the 1949 Marriage Act, which is for opposite-sex couples only, i.e. for men and women. And then there's the 2013 Marriage Act, which is for same-sex couples only. Two men, two women. Separate is not equal. To have two separate marriage laws, that's not true equality. Um, there's also discrimination in pension inheritance when one partner dies. Under both the civil partnership legislation and same-sex marriage law, when one partner dies, the surviving partner in a same-sex marriage or a same-sex civil partnership, they don't have the same right to inherit the full pension compared to if they were in an opposite-sex marriage under the 1949 Act. So just to give you an example, under the law it states very clearly that statutorily, that is on statute law, when in a same-sex marriage or civil partnership one person dies, the surviving partner can only inherit by law any contributions made to the deceased person's pension since 2005. So if they've been contributing to their pension pot since 1960 or 70, their surviving partner will not get any of those pension entitlements. Whereas, if they were in an opposite sex marriage under the 1949 Act, if one partner dies, the surviving partner gets all of their pension contributions going back to the very first year they began to make contributions. So you can see that a massive inequality. And there's a case being brought at the UK Supreme Court just last week, which is seeking to overturn that. A, a claimant, a gay man, has argued that under his current pension inheritance entitlement, if he dies, his partner will get a £1,000 a year survivor's pension. But if he went out on the street and married the first woman he met, from the day they were married, if he died the next day or the next week, she would get £45,000 a year. That's clear discrimination and a huge financial penalty. Another inequality in same-sex marriage is the so-called spousal veto whereby in a civil marriage where one partner is trans, transgender, that person cannot get a gender recognition certificate without the permission of their spouse. Now we don't require spouses to give permission if someone wants to move abroad, end the marriage, or even undergo gender reassignment surgery. There's no spousal veto for any of those important decisions, but under the Same-Sex Marriage Act, a spouse can veto their partner getting a gender recognition certificate. And that's really, really unfair. And the other big inequality, of course, is that there is still a ban on same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom, same-sex couples still cannot marry the person they love. And finally, enshrined in 
the Same-Sex Marriage Act is a prohibition by law on the Church of England and the Church of Wales conducting same-sex marriages. Even if they wish to, even if they decide they want to conduct a same-sex marriage, the law states they're not permitted to do so. So that's really, again, another clear example of discrimination. There are other inequalities as well. So for example, we've got some fantastic equality laws to protect everyone in society against discrimination. That's a real milestone achievement. But written into many of those equality laws are limited qualified exemptions for religious organizations. Not just places of worship like mosques, synagogues, churches, and temples, but also faith-run charities, hospitals, schools, nursing homes, and shelters for the homeless. Under the law, these religious institutions are allowed to discriminate against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Now, no other institution in our society has that opt-out, has that exemption. But religious organizations can discriminate by law on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity if they can show that it's necessary to preserve their religious ethos. Now, of course, I accept in a free society that there will be people of faith and religious institutions that don't agree with same-sex marriage, with equal rights for gay people, and so on. I'm saddened that they hold that view because, of course, all the major faiths have at the core of their values love, compassion, and kindness. So how can you fulfill those values if you discriminate? Um, nevertheless, nevertheless, it is the fact that same-sex couples and individuals can be discriminated against by religious institutions in certain circumstances. Um, I hope the law will change because I don't think people of faith should be allowed to discriminate and I don't think that's compatible with their faith either. Another issue we face is that trans people, transgender people, um, don't have a proper legislative framework. Yes, there was a Gender Recognition Act passed in 2004 which gives transgender people the right to legally change their gender in law, officially, and that's great. Yes, we have protection now against discrimination based on transgender identity, but, but, at the end of the day, the procedures for securing a gender recognition certificate are very, very onerous. They're not simple, they're not easy. There's lots of hoops and hurdles that trans people have to go through in order to get that certificate. So they must be 18 or over. They must live or work in their affirmed gender for at least two years and provide evidence of that. They've got to give evidence that they have been to a psychiatrist and got a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. And they've got to provide a declaration of their intention to live in their affirm gender for the rest of their lives. That's quite a lot of asks. I would take the view that if someone believes and feels they're transgender, they should be able to simply affirm that and get a gender recognition certificate. They shouldn't have to go through all those hoops and hurdles. And that is the model of law in other countries like Ireland and Malta. So I'd like to see the Gender Recognition Act amended or modified to make it easier and less onerous for trans people to be able to get a gender recognition certificate. Then there's the issue of bullying in our schools. We know from the evidence that over half of all young lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender kids have been bullied at school because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And this ranges from name calling and teasing to threats, menaces and actual physical violence in the playground or the classroom. Yet, 
Still today, less than half of all schools have an anti-bullying program that explicitly addresses anti-LGBT bullying. <coughs> they may have an anti-bullying program, but often it doesn't include LGBT issues. And we also know that faith schools are some of the schools where you have the most anti-LGBT bullying and where the staff do the least to tackle it. So there is still work to be done to make schools a safe place for LGBT kids. Now, the consequence, of course, of bullying is that young LGBT kids will often underperform at school or even truant. Uh, they will suffer from depression, anxiety, and sometimes have suicidal thoughts or even attempt suicide. Now surely we have to stop that. We have to stop that by making sure that anti-bullying programs do address prejudice against LGBT kids. Likewise in the wider society. We know from surveys that about a third of all LGBT people, that's nearly one million people in Britain, have been victims of homophobic, biphobic or transphobic hate crimes. That's really shocking. And again, it can just sometimes be low level in the terms of you know, insults and abuse. You know, it's low level, but it's still wrong. Uh, to ranging up to actual physical violent assaults. We also know that many LGBT people have not been just a victim of anti-LGBT hate crime once in their lives. Some have been multiple victims, three, four, five times over the course of their life. So again, we need to do something much more to tackle those hate crimes in the same way that we now rightly tackle race hate crimes, hate crimes against Muslim or Jewish people, hate crimes against women and others. You know, these are really serious damaging impacts. You know, some of you may remember that even in a big multicultural liberal city like London, LGBT people are still not safe. Just a few years ago, a 62-year-old gay man, Ian Bainham, was kicked to death in Trafalgar Square. In the heart of the gay village in Soho in London, there are regular violent attacks upon LGBT people. You know, this shouldn't be happening in the 21st century. What do we do about it? Well, again, education is often the key. But education is often failing LGBT kids. So, if we take sex and relationship education, you'll be pleased to have heard last week the government has announced that it's going to henceforth make sex and relationship education compulsory in every school. Up until now, it hasn't been compulsory, and lots of schools either haven't done it or they've done it very poorly. But now it's going to be mandatory. But it doesn't or won't include mandatory lessons on LGBT issues. So what message does that send to LGBT kids if they're not included in sex and relationship education? They will feel left out, neglected. They will feel unvalued, unaffirmed. Likewise, if they don't have good quality sex and relationship education, they will be more likely to be at risk of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. So it stands to reason, if we care about LGBT kids, that sex and relationship education ought to be mandatory in every school, as the government plans, but also mandatorily include LGBT issues. On top of that, we need mandatory equality and diversity lessons in schools to challenge not just homophobia, biphobia and transphobia, but racism, misogyny, prejudice against Muslim people, prejudice against Jewish people, prejudice against refugees and asylum seekers. We need those lessons to challenge all forms of prejudice. And they should start from the very first year of a child's primary education and continue regularly all throughout a child's life. Now why do I say that? It's very simple because 
we all know that no child is born bigoted. No child comes out of the womb with prejudice. That's learned behavior. Learned sometimes by bigoted family members or other kids. And where equality diversity lessons have been tried in schools, the level of bullying goes way down, the level of hate crime goes way down, the level of depression, anxiety, and mental health among LGBT kids goes way, way down. So it really does work. It really does make a positive difference. And I just can't understand why the government why successive governments have not made this a priority. Because I think all of us want to grow up in a society where we are accepted, where we're treated with dignity and respect, where we get on well with other people around us, where everyone's happy and no one feels excluded or discriminated against. Education can help make that happen. Another issue which is unfinished is, of course, the sometimes unequal way in which the law is enforced. So we may have good equality laws, but it all depends on enforcement. Do the police actually enforce these laws to protect LGBT people against hate crime? Do they enforce the law to stop discrimination and harassment in colleges, universities, workplaces, and so on? And often they now do, which is great. It's a big improvement from the past. But sometimes they don't. So some of you may have heard of the eight Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers. People like Beanie Man, Elephant Man, Vibes Cartel, Capleton, and so on. They have been putting out tracks some years ago which openly advocated the murder of LGBT people. Their tracks said to variously shoot, hang, burn, and drown LGBT people. Yeah. One of the most famous of those songs was Boom Bye Bye by Bridget Banton, where he advised people to get a gun, shoot a queer in the head, and then burn him alive. These songs were being openly performed and given airtime on radio in this country. It took a five-year campaign by the LGBT group Outrage to stop those lyrics being promoted. Now, I'm certain if a white singer had put out a track like that advocating killing black people, he would have been immediately arrested, tried, and jailed. But none of these singers were ever taken to court. Not once. You've also probably heard of cases of extremist Islamist clerics who say that gay people should be put to death. So some years ago there was a sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah al Faisal, who advocated the killing of Jews and Hindus. He was arrested, put on trial, convicted, and sentenced to nine years jail. Yet around the same time, Imam Abdul Muhid in East London said exactly the same thing, and he said, go out and kill homosexuals. Even though there were four witnesses, there was no prosecution. So why the double standards? Why is it when you say kill Jews and Hindus, you get nine years sentence? And when you say kill gay people, you get nothing. Another issue we have to face is the fact that Currently, under the rules for donating blood, any man who's ever had oral or anal sex with another man in the previous 12 months is prohibited from donating blood. Now, of course, we should protect the blood supply. And if someone is at risk of HIV or other sexually transmitted infections, it's very important they do not give blood. But this is a blanket rule. It says that if you've ever had oral or anal sex with another man in the previous 12 months, you can't give blood. Even if you're in a monogamous relationship, even if you never have risky sex, even if you always use a condom, you can't give blood. Yet, 
a heterosexual businessman who goes to New York and has lots of unprotected sex with women in a city where there's a huge heterosexual HIV epidemic, he can donate blood. Again, it's double standards. It's one law for straights and another for gays. That's not fair. In reality, of course, we could ask gay and bisexual men a few more questions on the blood donation form to identify their degree of risk. And of course, any men who are at risk of HIV or other sexual infections should not be given blood, should not give blood, and should be uh, prohibited from doing so. But those who are not at risk and who test HIV negative, they should be free. We don't need a 12-month exclusion period. It could easily be reduced to about three months and still protect the blood supply. The final issue I'd address is the way in which LGBT asylum seekers are often treated. The rate of refusal for an LGBT refugee is much higher than for a political, religious, or ethnic refugee. Um, on first application, the overwhelming majority of LGBT refugees are refused asylum, even where they have strong, compelling evidence. So they may come from countries like Sudan, Saudi Arabia, or Iran, where gay people can be put to death, can be hanged or stoned to death, but they'll still be questioned, challenged, and sometimes refused. Likewise, we have refusals from people who are fleeing homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic persecution in countries like Uganda and Nigeria. In Nigeria, the maximum penalty for same-sex relations is 14 years in jail. In Uganda, it's life imprisonment. Life imprisonment for having a sexual relationship with someone you love. That's absurd. And just two days ago, I fought with others to stop a Ugandan lesbian being deported back to Uganda, where she would have been at risk of mob violence, arrest, and imprisonment. The Home Office was trying to send her back, even though it was clear that she was a lesbian and that she was at grave risk. Why do we have to fight these cases when people obviously and clearly have a well-founded fear of persecution and should be given refuge and safe haven in this country? So that's a roundup of where we are in Britain, the inequalities that still remain and need to be resolved. So just to conclude, I'd like to just briefly give analysis of the global situation, which of course is much, much grimmer. There are 193 countries in the world. Of those, 73 still have a total ban on same-sex relations. That's 38% of the world's countries still have a total prohibition on same-sex relations. Penalties range from a few years imprisonment right up to life imprisonment. And in a handful of Muslim-majority countries, there is still the death penalty. Um, we're seeing right now a big backlash against LGBT people in about 15 or 20 countries, such as Russia, Brunei, and so on, and so on, and so on. Lots of countries are not going forward, they're going backwards with escalating enforcement of existing laws, the passage of new anti-gay laws, and so on. Um, but, nevertheless, there is progress. Those 15 or 20 countries that are in the throes of a homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic backlash are a minority. A minority out of the 193. Overall, the global trend is towards greater equality. So, for example, in recent years, we have seen the decriminalization of homosexuality in Mozambique, northern Cyprus, the Seychelles, Belize, the Pacific Island states of Nauru and Palau, and the West African island state of Seotome 
and Princip. Progress. Progress in unlikely places. Um, recently, about two years ago, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which is part of the African Union. In Africa, the vast majority of African countries still prohibit and criminalize same-sex relations. And sadly, Chad, which never before had anti-gay laws, has just passed <coughs> new anti-gay laws to criminalize same-sex relations for the first time. But nevertheless, the African Union's African Commission on Human and People's Rights did issue a declaration a couple of years ago which said that action should be taken to protect LGBT people against discrimination and hate crimes. Fantastic, amazing, surprising. A great tribute to African LGBT activists who've lobbied for that change. They made it happen. And everybody was so surprised, but very, very pleased at that declaration. Of course, a declaration is one thing, but implementing it is something else. So there's still work to be done there. We've also had a series of resolutions in the United Nations also deploring discrimination and hate crime against LGBT people. You know, the last two Secretary Generals of the UN, Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon, have both, in their terms of office, spoken out strongly on the principle that LGBT rights are human rights. Just recently, a new UN expert on LGBT issues has been appointed. There was a big, big fuss over it, and many of the African and Islamic countries tried to block his appointment, but they were defeated. Narrowly, but defeated. So he's now imposed, he's going to investigate the scale of anti-LGBT prejudice around the world and make recommendations about how it can best be tackled. In the Commonwealth, you know, the Commonwealth, which has a chance in which proclaims universal human rights for all Commonwealth citizens in every Commonwealth country. Fantastic. But look at the reality. 36 out of the 52 member states still criminalize same-sex relations. 36 out of 52. That's shocking. That's truly shocking. And the penalties in Trinidad and Tobago, you can be jailed for more than 20 years. In Malaysia, you can be jailed for more than 20 years and be flogged. In seven Commonwealth countries, there is life imprisonment. Tanzania, Guyana, Pakistan, and so on. Life imprisonment for a loving, committed same-sex relationship. So there's a big disjunction between what the Commonwealth espouses and what it actually does. I've been lobbying the Commonwealth on LGBT issues for nearly 30 years. Never once in all those almost three decades has the Commonwealth Summit ever once even discussed LGBT issues, let alone endorsed them. Not once. The Commonwealth Summit is held regularly. The next one is in Britain in 2018. They won't even allow LGBT issues on the agenda. It wasn't until 2011 that for the first time the Commonwealth Secretary General spoke out in support of LGBT rights. That was Kamalesh Chama, an Indian diplomat who was then the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. He was the first to speak out in support of LGBT rights. Some may say his speaking out was rather modest, infrequent, and not as strong as it could have been, but he did speak out to his great credit. Fantastic. An Indian Secretary General spoke out, whereas all the previous Secretary Generals failed to do so. So there is much, much more work still to be done around the world, even more so than here in Britain. My conclusion is that queer freedom knows no borders.
It transcends nationality and culture. It is a universal human rights principle. And it's also an unstoppable global trend. Despite backlash in some countries, the arc of history is bending towards justice for LGBT people. So our human rights may have been long delayed in many, many countries. But one thing is certain, they cannot and will not be denied. Thank you.